India is basically an agricultural country. Agriculture is the backbone of Indian economy. Agriculture is responsible for feeding our teeming millions and provides fodder to animals as well. Many industries draw their raw materials from agricultural produce and are known as agro-based industries. So now let us talk about the wet and dry agriculture. So firstly, farming practiced in areas receiving more than 75 centimeters of annual rainfall is called wet farming. Whereas farming practiced in regions with less than 75 centimeters of annual rainfall is called dry farming. Now let us talk about the crop rotation. It is a well-known fact that if the same type of crop is grown in the field year after year, it results in the loss of soil nutrients. Therefore, crops are grown in rotation one after the other. For example, pulses or any leguminous crop is grown after the cereal crop. Why? Because legumes have the ability of fixing nitrogen to the soil from the atmosphere. Moving on, let us now talk about crop combination. Crop combination is the process of cultivating multiple crops in the same field. Crop combination nurtures the soil and increases its fertility. It also offers the highest returns in farming. For example, maize, beans and squash. They make the soil organically richer with improved texture. Well, agricultural production and productivity can be increased in two ways, by expanding the cropped area and by increasing the intensity of cropping. So, the cropping intensity refers to the number of crops raised on a field during an agricultural year. The total cropped area as percentage of the net sown area gives a measure of cropping intensity. Thus, cropping intensity equals to total cropped area divided by net sown area into 100. Well, crop intensity varies from 100% in Manipur and Mizoram to 191.2% in Punjab 2011-12. This is followed by Haryana 184.7%, West Bengal 179.9%, Sikkim, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. It is low and very low in the states of Peninsula Plateaus, the densely populated northern plains, coastal plains and deltas which are irrigated or are favoured by sufficient rainfall are marked with high intensity of cropping. Very low and low intensities predominate in the arid, semi-arid and semi-humid lands. Now, moving on, let us talk about some of the major problems of Indian agriculture and their possible solutions. So, firstly, small and fragmented land holdings. In most parts of India, the land holdings are small and fragmented. This results in large-scale wastage of fertile lands and labour. In order to avoid this large-scale wastage of fertile land, consolidation of land needs to be done. Number 2. Seeds Seed is the basic agricultural input and it has always been critical to higher agricultural production. Unfortunately, good quality seeds are out of reach of the majority of farmers because of high price of better seeds. In order to solve this problem, the Government of India established the National Seeds Corporation, NSC, in 1963 and the State Farmers Corporation of India, SFCI, in 1969. Number 3. Manures, Fertilizers and Biocides Indian soils have been used for growing crops over thousands of years without caring much for replenishing it. This has led to depletion and exhaustion of soil resulting in their low productivity. 
This is a serious problem which can be solved by using more manures and fertilizers. Manures and fertilizers play the same role in relation to good soils as good food in relation to body. Thus, increasing the consumption of fertilizers is a barometer of agricultural prosperity. However, there are practical difficulties in providing sufficient manures and fertilizers in all parts of a country of India's dimensions inhabited by poor peasants. Cow dung provides the best manure to the soils. It has been felt that organic manures are essential for keeping the soil in good health. The government has given high incentives, especially in the form of heavy subsidy for using chemical fertilizers. Pests, germs and weeds cause heavy loss to crops. Biocides, pesticides, herbicides and weedicides are used to save the crops and to avoid losses. The fourth problem that we have is irrigation. Although India is the second largest irrigated country of the world after China, only one third of the cropped area is under irrigation. Irrigation is the most important agricultural input in a tropical monsoon country like India, where rainfall is uncertain, unreliable and erratic. India cannot achieve sustained progress in agriculture unless and until more than half of the cropped area is brought under assured irrigation. Number 5. Lack of Mechanization in spite of large-scale mechanization of agriculture in some parts of the country, most of the agricultural operations is larger part are carried on human hand using simple and conventional tools and implements like wooden plow, sickle, etc. Thus, there is an urgent need to mechanize the agricultural operation so that wastage of labor force is avoided and farming is made convenient and efficient. The next problem that we have is soil erosion. Large tracts of fertile lands suffer from soil erosion by wind and water. These areas must be properly treated and restored to its original fertility. Tree plantation, bunding, contour ploughing, etc., are some of the effective methods of checking soil erosion. The next problem of Indian agriculture is agricultural marketing. Agricultural marketing still continues to be in a bad shape in rural India. In the absence of sound marketing facilities, the farmers have to depend upon local traders and middlemen for the disposal of their farm produce, which is sold at throwaway prices. In order to save the farmer from their clutches of money lenders and the middlemen, the government has come out with regulated markets. These markets generally introduce a system of competitive buying and helps in eradicating malpractices. Number 8. Inadequate Storage Facilities Storage facilities in the rural areas are either totally absent or grossly inadequate. Under such conditions, the farmers are compelled to sell their produce immediately after the harvest at the prevailing market prices, which are very less. At present, there are a number of agencies engaged in warehousing and storage activities. The Food Corporation of India, FCI, the Central Warehousing Corporation, CWC, and State Warehousing Corporations are among the principal agencies engaged in this task. The central government is also implementing the scheme for establishment of national grid of rural godowns since 1979-80. Now, let us talk about the use of modern technology in agriculture. Number 1. High yielding variety of seeds. New high yielding varieties HYV seeds for wheat and rice were brought to India from Mexico and Philippines respectively. HYV seeds for jowar and maize were also introduced. The widespread use of HYV seeds increased the farm production.
Number two, fertilizers. Use of fertilizers constitute a very important component of modern technological inputs in the agricultural field. The production and consumption of fertilizers has increased many fold after the independence and more so with the beginning of the Green Revolution era. Next we have is irrigation. Use of high yielding varieties of seeds and fertilizers heavily depends upon the assured water supply to the crops and provision of regular and in Uninterrupted irrigation is the basic input for increasing farm production. India has made considerable progress in the field of irrigation. Number 4. Farm Mechanization In spite of large-scale mechanization of agriculture, in some parts of the country, most of agricultural operations in larger parts of India are carried on by human hand using simple and conventional tools and implements like wooden plough, sickle, etc. Little or no use of machines is made in ploughing, sowing, irrigating, thinning and pruning, weeding, harvesting, threshing and transporting the crops. This is especially the case with small and marginal farmers. However, mechanization is slowly becoming very popular ever since the inception of Green Revolution. The number of tractors have increased. Also, the availability of electric pumping sets have also increased. Now, let us talk about the changeover from subsistence to commercial agriculture. Firstly, let us know what is subsistence agriculture. In this type of agriculture, farmer produces exclusively for his own consumption and not for sale in the market. Whereas when we talk about commercial agriculture, in this type of agriculture, crops are cultivated for commercial purposes or we could say for selling it in the market. Well, before independence, most parts of India had subsistence agriculture. Farmers were too poor to use chemical fertilizers and high yielding varieties of seeds. Facilities like electricity, irrigation and credit were badly lacking. Large scale improvement has been brought in Indian agriculture after independence. Farming techniques were improved and the holding became large and properly arranged as a result of consolidation. Mechanization of agriculture increased. The farmers could afford to purchase chemical fertilizers and high yielding varieties of seeds. Also, irrigation, electricity and loans, etc. In this way, our agriculture could come out of subsistence stage. Indian farmer is now in a position to produce sulpurous crops with the help of modern inputs like HYV seeds, fertilizers, irrigation and farm machinery. He can earn some money by selling his produce in the market. Thus, there is transformation of character of Indian agriculture from subsistence to commercial type of agriculture. Now, let us talk about the scope of Green Revolution. Green Revolution owes its origin in the findings of new drop variety of wheat seed by Dr. Norman Borlaug in Mexico. Although the seeds of the Green Revolution were sown in early 1950s in Mexico, the term Green Revolution was first used on 8th March 1968 in Washington, D.C. when William S. addressed the Society for International Development on the subject Green Revolution, Accomplishment and Apprehensions. In India, the seeds of Green Revolution were first field tested in the drought year of 1964-65. High yielding varieties program was introduced in 1966. The production of food grains in 1967-68 was 25% higher than in 1966-67. The increase was more than the increase recorded in the preceding 16 years of planned period. This unprecedented increase in the production was nothing less than a revolution and it was termed as Green Revolution. 
So now let us move on to the impact of Green Revolution. So the first impact of Green Revolution was increase in the agricultural production. The second impact was the prosperity of farmers. The third impact was the reduction in import of food grains. The fourth impact was capitalistic farming. The fifth impact was raising the level of income of the farmers. The sixth impact was industrial growth. The seventh impact was providing rural employment. Next, let us talk about the demerits or problems of Green Revolution. Firstly, intercrop imbalances. The effect of Green Revolution is primarily felt on food grains. Although all food grains, including wheat, rice, jowar, bajra and maize, have gained from the Green Revolution, it is wheat which has benefited the most, thus creating intercrop imbalances. The second problem is regional disparities. Green Revolution technology has given birth to growing disparities in economic development at inter- and intra-regional levels. The most affected areas are Punjab, Haryana and Western Uttar Pradesh in the north and Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu in the south. It has hardly touched the eastern regions, including Assam, Bihar, West Bengal and Orissa, and also the arid and semi-arid areas of western and southern India. Number three, increase in interpersonal inequalities. It has been observed that it is the big farmer having 10 hectares or more land who is benefited the most from green revolution because he has the financial resources to purchase farm implements, better seeds, fertilizers, irrigation facilities, etc. As against this, the small and marginal farmers do not have the financial resources to purchase these farm inputs and are deprived of the benefit of green revolution technology, which increases the interpersonal inequalities. The fourth demerit is unemployment. Except in Punjab and to some extent in Haryana, farm mechanization under green revolution has created widespread unemployment among agricultural laborers in the rural areas. Next, moving on, let us talk about the second green revolution. So the second green revolution refers to the practicing of sustainable agriculture, that is protecting natural resources from becoming increasingly degraded and polluted and using production technologies that conserve and enhance the natural resource base of crops, forest, inland and marine fisheries. Moving on with the strategies for second green revolution, the first that we have is micro-irrigation system. Adoption of micro-irrigation technology will enable optimal synergies of the three components of the green revolution, that is the improved seeds, water and fertilizers. Micro-irrigation system enables direct and concentrated application of water to the root zone of crops through specially designed emitters and piping networks. The next that we have is organic farming. Green revolution technologies involving greater use of synthetic agrochemicals such as fertilizers and pesticides with adoption of nutrient responsive high yielding varieties of crops have boosted the production output per hectares in most cases, but with significant adverse effects such as damage to natural resources and human health as well as agriculture itself. So the increasing consciousness about the conservation of environment as well as of health hazards caused by agrochemicals has brought a major shift in consumer preference towards food quality particularly in the developed countries. Thus, global consumers are increasingly looking forward to organic food that is considered safe and hazard-free.
Next, precision farming. The term precision farming or precision agriculture is capturing the imagination of many people concentrated with the production of food, feed and fiber. It offers the promise of increasing productivity while decreasing production cost and minimizing the environmental impact on farming. Precision farming provides a new solution using a systems approach for today's agricultural issues, such as the need to balance productivity with environmental concerns. Next is green agriculture. Green agriculture is a system of cultivation with the help of integrated pest management, integrated nutrient supply, and integrated natural resources management systems. Green Revolution Agriculture does not exclude the use of minimum essential quantities of mineral fertilizers and chemical pesticides. Next we have is Eco-Agriculture. Eco-Agriculture is defined as an approach that brings together agricultural development and conservation of biodiversity. The last that we have is white agriculture. White agriculture is a system of agriculture based on a substantial use of microorganisms, particularly fungi. The concept of white agriculture took shape in 1986 in China. White refers to the white-coated scientists and technicians performing high-tech processes to produce food directly from microorganisms or to use them to improve agriculture. Lastly, let us talk about diversifying Indian agriculture. Well, the main emphasis of Indian agriculture has been on growing food crops so that food requirements of growing population could be met. However, proper place should be given to animal husbandry, fishing, dairy farming, poultry farming, etc. So now talking about animal husbandry, it forms a very important part of Indian agriculture. Animal husbandry and dairy development plays a prominent role in the rural economy in supplementing the income of rural households, particularly the landless and small and marginal farmers. It also provides subsidiary occupation in semi-urban areas and more so for people living in hilly, tribal and drought-prone areas where crop output may not sustain the family.